Hello once again to my Pokemon Soul Silver Randomizer Nuzlocke. Uh, once again, it is going to be a voiceover video because my microphone was not working when I filmed this episode. But that's okay, I will voice it over for you and, <laughs> and just kind of narrate through it. It is a very exciting episode. We are going to start off here with the Camino Girls in Ecrateague City. Um, we just ran into our rival who once again got beaten to a pulp in his words by the Camino Girls uh, who are here to test us and see if we're ready to take on Lugia, who in fact is not going to be Lugia in our game. It is a randomized legendary which we are very excited to encounter. The problem with these Camino Girls is you cannot heal or switch the lineup of your Pokemon in between each battle. Each one normally has an Eevee evolution, but it will be randomized in this. So here we go with the first battle against Camino Girl Zuki, and she sends out a Blossom. So first one is a fully evolved grass type. Doesn't feel like too much of an issue. My goal here is to go in with Hades, and every time I'm going to go with the Hypnosis so we can feel out the moves, switch out if we need to depending on typings, and also get a little bit of that chip damage with Hades um, from his Bad Dreams ability. I also figured it would be good with Hades to be out there because if he starts, he can at least get that leftovers heal, heal from holding leftovers. Um, but what I did not plan for is for Blossom to wake up after just one turn and to then use a Stun Spore move, which we are now stuck with for the rest of the five battles. If it had been Sleep Powder, we would eventually wake up. If it had been Freezing, we would eventually unfreeze. Um, but really toxic and paralyzed. Paralyzation is what we couldn't really deal with. So now I'm stuck in an odd situation where I am not taking a lot of damage from Blossom's Magical Leaf. And I'm healing a little bit each turn. But we're, our speed has been cut in half from the paralysis. And we are now going to have to lead the next four battles with a paralyzed half damaged Hades. So right off the bat the plan is not going well as planned. And I'm going to have to work through it right here. I was going to go in with just some faint attacks instead of the Ominous Winds. My intent was that we would save Ominous Wind for the last couple of battles. But now we're clearly already off track for that. So I'm going to switch into Ted, who has been an awesome tank pivot Pokemon for us. Allowing us to switch in safely without taking too much damage. While also using Yawn and things like that. And it has Belly Drum in case we want to make it more offensive. Overall, it's like a really useful Pokemon for this playthrough. Especially for the Nuzlocke setting where we can't generally heal. Uh, but Ted comes in and does get the Yawn off after an odd choice of a sweet scent from Blossom. Which lowers our evasiveness, but we weren't going to be evasive anyway. So odd decision. It then throws another Magical Leaf at us, which per usual does not do much of any damage to us. And then Snorlax comes in and gets the Body Slam Paralysis down to red health allowing us to go with another body slam, outspeeding it, cause of paralysis, and taking down the first Camino girl. Uh, so, so far, so good. Didn't want to get par paralyzed on uh, Hades, but we did defeat it without losing any Pokemon, and we have most of our Pokemon not even touched with damage. So we go into the next one against Camino girl Naoko, and she actually ends up with Umbreon. I'm not sure if she usually has an Umbreon, or if one of her Eevees got randomized into a different Eevee evolution, but she has Umbreon. Now, Umbreon generally has Sym Synchronize, so I did decide to go with Hypnosis because Synchronize will not work on Hades since we're already paralyzed. Whereas if I try to put Umbreon to sleep with my Victory Belt, we will get also put to sleep. Plus, we can now see with Umbreon's lower attack stats, let's, well, both attack and special attack are lower. My plan here was that, hey, Umbreon's pretty weak offensively. We may be able to eat up a couple turns, get some leftovers healed on Hades to put it in a better shape for future battles, while also whittling down its HP from our ability and from using Nightmare. And that's what I did here, because Ominous Wind is weak against Dark, and uh, Faint Attack wouldn't do much against Umbreon either, and so I figured set the Nightmare up, try to heal up with Faint Attack, and then we'll just chip away at it. This does seem to be working, because we got it down to half health after just two turns, um, and then on the third turn it stays asleep, so Bad Dreams ability and nightmare work in unison again putting it down to like one hp and getting us up back to the 82 hp spot uh, making me feel comfortable enough that we can lead next battle with hades safely so i go ahead and i switch out to preserve that hp and once again go for ted because he is the bulky one who can withstand any attack thrown at it um and the nightmare luckily 
keeps Umbreon asleep and knocks Umbreon out. So we switch in Ted safely, take no damage, get the Umbreon defeated, um, get a little HP on both of our Pokemon, and we defeated the second Kamino Girl. Now going into the third, I'm still pretty satisfied because we're two down and five Pokemon, well six actually technically still alive because of our bonus little, uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know who's in my party at this point, but we basically have a floating six Pokemon that's been <laughs> been used just in case we need to swap around. Uh, we get a Roserade third, which is a very similar annoying move pool to the Blossom we faced, and it just has a higher attack stat in general, so when it hits us with that Magical Leaf, which wasn't even a crit, and gets me down to 42 health, I know I need to go ahead and switch out, even with Leftovers bringing us back up to, I think, yeah, 50 health. It just wasn't feeling great. Uh, well, and I don't know what I was thinking, because apparently I did go for a move. I thought I switched out there, but apparently I did not. In hindsight, I would have. Um, okay, I gave it one turn, assuming it wouldn't wake up, I guess. And then I switched out just to get that extra turn of leftovers in. That must have been my mindset at the time. And now, like always, I switch into Ted. And then Roserade wakes up on the second turn, throwing out a Magical Leaf, which, again, I was like, oh, we can take this easy. But it does do a little bit of damage, getting us close to half health. Then it gets another attack in because it outspeeds us. So basically, before Ted even gets a shot off, we get hit with a crit, and that's 100 HP worth of health. And while our Body Slam does go ahead and take out Roserade because it is not a very uh, bulky Pokemon, now Ted is not in a range where I feel safe switching into it, unless the Pokemon is asleep and it's on the first turn of being asleep. Uh, I just, yeah, I don't want to be losing Ted this close to the Elite Four. Uh, we're through our eight gyms. We do have one Legendary Encounter left, but that's that's not enough to make me feel good about losing Ted. Worst case scenario, I would probably take Ted out of the party, and uh, like if we lost Ted and we couldn't use him anymore, I'd probably switch to Suicune and give it more of a defensive build, but I would rather stay with the normal typing because then it only has the... The fighting weakness and it's immune to ghost types so if we get stuck in a situation where they're using a Gengar or something really fast we can pivot in with a Snorlax so that was my mindset there my mindset on a slow king which happened to be our fourth encounter was one of panic because I wanted to switch in and use a water type move but I was worried about the psychic type attacks that slow king could have and then once it started using nasty plots I was like oh geez we cannot be switching into Victory Bell, which is not the most bulky Pokemon. It's not the weakest, but it certainly wouldn't make me feel safe switching it in, um, even if it did outspeed Slowking. So I just decided to try to tank it out with Emperor because Empoleon and Slowking back and forth feel pretty evenly matched, especially since we have Surf and it's using Water Pulse now. And that turns out to be the right move because none of the Water Pulses, thank God, end up confusing and we're able to get the KO with Surf. Bringing us to the last Kamino Girl, and still no losses with our Pokemon. Uh, we are pretty damaged across the board, other than Lucario and Victory Bell, so typing is really going to be interesting for this last battle. So hopefully we have something strong against it that hasn't taken a lot of damage. And, wouldn't you figure, Kamino Girl brings in a Flying type and Togekiss, which is probably close to worst case scenario. At which point, I'm looking at my Pokemon, kind of freaking out a little, trying to think, who can we switch in that won't completely get destroyed? And I go with Gloop, because he's been hanging out in the back of our party, and while not EV trained, he does have enough natural bulk to at least get a safe switch in, and hopefully, my goal was to get off one Yawn attack, just to try to put Togekiss to sleep in case this goes down. And then I look around, and I realize I accidentally got rid of Yawn instead of Raindance when I was teaching it, uh... One of its new moves, I think Hidden Power or something, it learned. So instead, I have to just go straight on the offensive with Gloop, hoping for the Paralysis. And I get the first turn Paralysis, which was super, super lucky. And then, to add insult to injury on the side of the Camino Girl, I get another Body Slam is in Togekiss is paralyzed and can't move, then switches to extreme speed to try to get the first attack in, does a decent amount of damage, but also allows me to stay alive and get one more body slam. Now I go into this next body slam assuming I'm going to be fainting, but Togus Kiss misses on the attack because it's paralyzed, and then it happens again. So Togekiss went for extreme speed twice in a row, both of which would have, de would have defeated Gloop, uh, 
but it was paralyzed both times, allowing Gloop to get the surprising KO on Togekiss, um, proving its worth for sure, and winning us the title bell from the Kamino Curls. Now letting us have a chance to go and actually capture the Lugia replacement legendary, something I am super excited about, hoping that maybe we'll get a Ho-Oh or a Moltres or something that is flying and fire, because those are two types we don't have, but also open to other flying type legendaries in general, of which there are absolutely plenty in this generation. So I go up and heal, and then I head over to Olivine City, and I jump in the water at the far left edge of Olivine, and this is where I need to go ahead and surf to the World Islands. There are four islands, and the one we're trying to get to is the top right island. I had battled most of these trainers doing, tra um, doing leveling up way back in episode 7 or 8, uh, but I wasn't sure if I had actually defeated all of them, so I start to get a little nervous and I don't want to take any damage or have any close calls, even though I probably shouldn't have been nervous given that these trainers are in the level 20s at highest. And I go into the, the leftmost island, which I think looks like the correct one at first, and then I realize as soon as I get in there that the rock formations and stuff are just not shaped the way they should be for the entrance to Lugia. The Lugia entrance is... Uh, you usually have to come in on the right side and then walk around the back and then swim around the back side of the island up to the front um, in a counterclockwise fashion, whereas this island was more of a clockwise from the back to the front. So I realized that wasn't the right island, and then I saw the one to the right and was like, yep, that is the one. So I dodged the trainers until this very last one, who I cannot get around because that rock is deceivingly close. And I have to go ahead and battle him. But we do it in a quick fast forward mode because he has one Pokemon. It is a Cyndaquil, level 25, and we are using a Gloop, level 40. Uh, I am leading with Gloop here because my intention is to go into our legendary battle and to use either, uh, depending on the attacking Pokemon, my hope was to go ahead and the pause in that video is because my mom actually called in real life as opposed to in the game, which I thought was funny. But anyway, Gloop takes out Cyndaquil. My goal with Gloop going into the battle against the Legendary is, depending on the moves, I wanted to either use Flash, because Gloop is going to be our Flash Pokemon for the cave, and that'll lower the Legendary Pokemon's accuracy and buy us time to try to throw a bunch of Pokeballs at it. Or I can use something like Mud, Mom to, Mud Bomb to try to get uh, speed decreases. I just basically, I had a couple strategies with Gloop, depending on what we had to deal with. I also still do have at this point, I realized I had Rain Dance still on Gloop after that, thinking I had Yawn. So I do have the opportunity, if it's a fire type, to just throw Rain Dance at it and prevent it from hurting us too much. Uh, I just, this is a tough battle. Unlike some of the wild legendaries we've run into, which, I mean, it's been Suicune a couple times now. Those, those legendaries are very low level and they don't really pose a threat to defeating any of my Pokemon, and they're they're optional encounters. They're my first encounter on a route, whereas this is the one legendary static encounter at level 45 that we are going to be we're going to basically be forced to have this encounter. And I have a Master Ball, but since this Pokemon can't run, I don't want to have to use the Master Ball. So, and I, I was actually disappointed I missed that item there. That's why went back on the screen but i don't want to use the master ball there are level 70 pokemon at the second half of the game once we get into the kanto region i am going to be continuing this nuzlocke all the way through until our battle with red at the top of mount silver and therefore i want to have the ability to really beef up our team come that time because of the 10 percent level boost i have given all the pokemon in this playthrough his pikachu will actually hit level 100 in that mount silver encounter and his other pokemon will be roughly level 97 uh maybe 98 in that point maybe even 99 essentially his team will be level 97 through 100 we will need a very good team to beat it. I think if we're in just close to level 90, we'll be okay. But I want to make sure we, if we're only going to be close to level 90, we have the right team. Because his could get randomized. This isn't the typical Mount Silver battle we'll be going against. We're actually going to have to randomize and hope he doesn't have legendaries and stuff put in the slots of the Pokemon he normally would have. Um, even the Pikachu could randomize into something annoying, you never know. So... That's what my mindset is. I would like to have the opportunity to catch the legendaries in the future. It's a long story short. Or if we run into one in the wild, maybe we come across the wild, I don't know, Geratina, and we want to catch that. I just don't want to have to waste the Master Ball here if I can help it. 
So anyway, back to the actual storyline. We come to the Whirl Islands, get to the bottom, and we arrive where the Kamino girls do their little dance, and we have an opportunity to battle Lugia, aka the Mystery Legendary. Um, of course, in the animation, it's going to show Lugia. And the other thing I did mention as I traversed this cave was the one exception to the first Pokemon on the route being our encounter is for a static encounter like this one, I count it as a separate encounter from the World Island encounters. Uh, that's similar to you would catch a Pokemon in Mount Coronet in Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, but you also would catch either Palkia or Dialga at the top of Mount Coronet. So I'm treating it similarly, and I think that's how people usually do it in Nuzlocks. So here we begin the battle, and thank god we find a Rayquaza, which I said we needed a flying type. Getting a very fast, very offensive flying type is perfect, especially when it has the part dragon typing, because that'll negate some of the, th the lightning weakness. So that was a great thing to see. I also know that Rayquaza has a huge amount of attack and special attack. We are pretty special attack heavy right now, but the move Fly, which we need to teach it to fly around unfortunately, is a physical attack and Rayquaza has the ability to do both. So that puts us in a very, very good spot where we can have a mixed attacker with pretty good speed if I EV train it in speed. The only problem is I need to make sure we do not kill Rayquaza. Um, I'm willing to sacrifice a Pokemon, even one of our party Pokemon. Obviously, I'm coming in. I'm planning to just use Gloop's Flash up until Gloop is gone. Uh, Gloop has been great for us, but I need to keep the accuracy down on this Rayquaza so that I can get my other Pokemon in. Especially knowing now that we do have a Flying type, and I need to be able to switch into Victory Bell to use Sleep Powder. So, I let Gloop go after a few Flashes, hoping that that'll lead us into a good position to actually put it to sleep and do some damage. So I bring in Ted next, which I think is interesting because it doesn't mean I'm putting it to sleep. Um, I'm giving it a yawn and then I'm going for the body slam. And this strategy has bitten me in the butt in the past where it accidentally got paralyzed instead of sleeping. But I'm coming in using Ted anyway because I need to test out how strong Rayquaza's attacks really are. I go for the first turn body slam, which surprisingly does more than half and paralyzes Rayquaza. So the paralysis is fine. We prefer to sleep, make it sleep to make it easier to catch, but at least the paralysis, it won't heal. As, at least I think it won't heal the paralysis, but I need to switch out because we now apparently can't, we're going to end up killing it if we go again with another body slam. The, the paralysis helps us get a safe switch in, and I figure, hey, let's just peck away at it with peck because... We have a very weak flying type move that we can use with Emperor. Rayquaza is missing all over the place and it is paralyzed. So we should be able to get it down into the red very easily and then start throwing Pokeballs at it. Unfortunately, I don't know if I missed this before, Rayquaza knows Rest, which I never... I guess I've never had a Rayquaza at a low enough level in a game to know that it was going to have the move Rest in its move pool. I think usually that move must get overwritten unless I just have a poor memory. But since it's level 45, it does have rests right now, and it just gets rid of the entire status conditions. No, it's not. It's uh, it's asleep, but it's only asleep for two turns. So I decide let's go right back into Ted and do a body slam on it once again. At least while it's sleeping, we can get half its health down. And my plan is basically to rinse and repeat the same strategy I just used, which is to body slam. We get a lower roll on the first body slam, so I decide I'm going to chance a second one as Rayquaza wakes up. That second one, while it gave me a minor heart attack as I watched that health bar dwindle down, it did ultimately work because we got it into the red and I was able to get the yawn off. So now I'm at the point where it's about to fall asleep and we need to just start hucking Pokeballs at it. I brought 30 Ultra Balls plus all the other random Pokeballs that Kurt had provided for us. And so I come in here and I say, okay, we're going to take down this Rayquaza. I know we can do it, we just need to figure out how we're going to do it. Um, not take down the Rayquaza, catch it. <laughs> I, I just need to throw enough and I need to know which ones to use to catch. So we begin the long, long journey of hoping I can throw everything. I also need to keep track of how many turns are going by because we cannot let it use struggle. Luckily, the, the, um, the move rest is a 10 PP move instead of five. So it's easy to count out a bunch of those and then having it know other moves like hyper voice and stuff that buys us about 40 turns. And I only have 30 ultra balls. So I'm pretty confident we're 
going to catch it unless I find that it's starting to do too much damage to us. And then I'm going to have to switch into a Master Ball. But wouldn't you figure on only the third Ultra Ball I throw, we catch the Rayquaza. It was so much easier to catch. 23 feet long and 455 pounds. I wish I had that ratio of body fat to foot, feet tall. Um, and we have to go ahead and name it now. Rayquaza will be the sixth member of our team. Um, I will be adding him right to the party. I will, after this episode, be EV training him in speed for sure, and then maybe a mix of attack and special attack. We will see. I need him to at least partially use special attack. I mean, physical attack, because we only really have Lucario as a physical sweeper. But I think having Maverick, the flying Pokemon, is going to be an outstanding addition, and it will give us the much-needed type coverage on fighting types that we have been missing. And now I'm feeling really good going into the Pokemon League, especially since we've kept all of our team alive to this point. So the last thing I do want to do before I finish up this episode is I decide to jump into the water here and get our Whirl Island encounter just for a little bonus, see what we can find. Um, and of course, we caught a Rayquaza, so the game rewards us with a Quillfish. Um, I pretty much haphazardly throw a Quick Ball at it because I don't care to put any effort into catching it. I will never use this Quillfish. And we catch the Quillfish with the Quick Ball. So we give it a nickname. Oh, I forget to give it a nickname because that's how much I care about Quillfish. And we go back to the Max Repel so we can climb our way out of this dungeon. Oh wait, I had an extra escape rope. Look at that. I surprise myself sometimes. Now though, I jump in the water so that we can get back to the city where we will now be able to pick up a Rayquaza, teach it fly, and not have to do the switching back and forth and back and forth between dead Altaria and living Pokemon. And all that sorts of stuff, because that was getting a little crazy. I don't like having a fainted Pokemon, even if it's just for using HMs. You never know if there's going to be a situation where a Pokemon like Whirlwinds or Roars and you end up switching into a different Pokemon that you're not supposed to be using for the run. It's just a weird thing to have to do. But that's kind of the way the game threw it at us. Um, I'm sure there's other alternate rules for Nuzlocke that I could come up with, such as like after a certain route you must catch one flying type and it's the first one you find. We actually did do that, we just happened to let them faint, because, whoops. Um, that being the Murkrow and the Altaria, which, Murkrow I wish we kept longer. I could have even boxed it. Um, I didn't plan to use it throughout the league just because of Darkrai already being Dark-type, but I thought we would eventually just replace Murkrow and have it in the box until we got to the Kanto side of things, and then we would have been able to use a Duskstone to make it a Haunchcrow, and it would have become much more useful. But we lost that back in the gym battle against, uh, I think it was Chuck. So, here we are, though. It's all so far working out, because we now have Maverick the Rayquaza. It is only level 45, and our next challenge is the Elite Four, with which, which with the 10% level boost, the highest level Pokemon in the Elite Four's teams will be 53, and so that will be our level cap going in. That should give us a pretty solid chance of beating the first two or three Elite Four members, since their Pokemon will start out, I think, at the highest level of 48, and will be at 53, roughly. Um, but then Lance's level cap is up to, I think, 56 at that point. Um, Lance's Dragonite will be level 55 or 56, um, depending on, let's see, 10%. It's usually level 50. I think the 10%, it should just go to 55, which means I will just basically, I'm putting the level cap at 58 for Lance. I don't think we'll have to, I don't think we're going to be reaching that level cap though. It's, and it's pretty hard to say like, oh, we can't go up to this level when we're locked into the Elite Four. Um, I know people do it in Nuzlocke, but that's fine. Um, here I just go through all the deaths we've had so far. Um, in general, War Turtle we're choosing not to use because we caught the Suicune and we can't have two encounters from the same place. Uh, Muck, Barney the Muck was awesome. He helped a lot in the first half of the game. Thank God we were able to swap him out for Snorlax just basically right after he fainted. I already talked about Murkrow. That was a mistake losing Murkrow. Um, Drowsy and Quagsire both I didn't even remember to give nicknames to because they were, you know... They were planned deaths, pretty much, based on where we were bringing them and what we were using them for. And then, of course, Altaria was the first <laughs> loss we had in the entire game, and we needed to keep using it to fly around. Um, but so far, no devastating losses to the team. 
which I am very thankful for. We definitely don't need to be seeing any losses because it does take a very long time to EV train outside in this game, like outside of recording, and I don't want to have to keep doing it if I can help it, especially liking the team I have now. Um, as you just saw, Maverick is an awesome Pokemon to see walking around behind you in the overworld. <laughs> it is massive and takes up like two sprite sizes. Don't know why I'm dancing around here on the screen. I think I'm just talking about Pokemon and telling you... Okay, I must have been explaining how we do have one more encounter I'm going to go grab before I end the episode. That encounter being the Route 26 encounter. Normally... So we already got Route 27. That is when you start out the game in uh, your hometown of... Is it New Bark Town? Is it New Bark Town or is that Gen 3? I don't even remember now. Well, we're flying there now. So essentially we fly out to... And I will wait till the map shows it. New Bark Town, I was right. So we fly over to New Bark Town. We already got the Route 27 encounter to the right here. But if we continue on now, because we have the HM Waterfall we will be able to find a Route 26 encounter, um, and that'll be the last encounter, last event we complete for this episode. And that'll give us the opportunity in the next episode to go and make one last find, last ditch attempt in the Victory Road location to get a Pokemon. Unlikely to use that Pokemon in the Elite Four, but we'll have it, we'll get that encounter, and then we will take on the Elite Four. Um, I go ahead here and I teach Waterfall to Emperor. He now has Surf, Whirlpool, and Waterfall, which I do not like as, as a move pool. But he's our only choice for Waterfall, and at least we can keep him in the party this way. And then just simply uh, remove those moves from him in Blackthorn City once we have the ability to fly back to the Pokemon League and go back and forth. So we enter Tojo Falls, we jump into the water, and we jump up this Waterfall. I'm doing everything on fast forward now because most of this stuff is just generic walking around. Uh, we go up here and there is a moonstone up under the waterfall that, again, we're probably not using. But if we have a Pokemon that can utilize it, we'll go ahead and catch it. And Well, if it's the first encounter, we'll catch it and we'll see what happens. We come up here to the girl who usually has a Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, Venusaur, and she starts with a Mime Jr., which is easily handled, then goes to a Flaffy, which we can easily handle in most situations, but it, paraly it paralyzes us again. And then I see a Rhyperior, which I quickly switch out from because I do not want to lose Darkrai and a Silly Trainer on Victory Road. And Victor is able to take out... Did I say Emperor? Victor takes out the uh, Rhyperior. I don't know if... I, I missed if we got Whirlwinded or something, but we shouldn't have because Rhyperior doesn't know that move. Uh, anyway, we then come in here to this woman who gets a Sandstorm, which I, in real time, when I thought I was recording my voice, I mocked because I am not a Sandstorm using per person. Plus, with Rayquaza, we have Airlock, so it doesn't even help us anymore. Um, so yeah, I mocked that very aggressively about getting sandstorm from someone i hate when you wait to like the end of the game and it's like oh right before the elite four here's your sandstorm tm so now if you haven't built your team which you probably have at this point you can go ahead and recreate the entire team around a sandstorm pokemon like that is just so silly to me and i wish he gave us a move like flamethrower or ice beam or even hyper beam which i don't tend to use but hey at least it's a strong attack um or throw me throw me a bone of something i'll use like reflect or light screen something useful to me sandstorm is just such a waste this late in the game unless you've been planning the entire game to get that tm oh, that's the end of that rant now i carefully run by all the trainers because i'm going to use them to level up after i've finished ev training rayquaza because i'm just trying to get the route 26 encounter um so i do a pretty good job dodging most of them nope oh, and I don't... Oh, yeah, I had to check the map to make sure I knew when I was at Route 26. Um, Route 27, we are still on, so we are almost to 26. Route 26 starts at the line when you're on... You're on the docks running by all the fishermen. Um, that converts to Route... Ooh, a Charmeleon. Look at that. Um, that's when it converts to Route 26, which is in the, the games, the Kanto games. Um, I get past the Psychic Trainer, and I cautiously progress forward... And I see another trainer. Oh, it's an ace trainer, actually. And now we convert and we are on Route 26 where we can get our encounter. Unfortunately, I wait and I wait and I yell words and I say, look over there. And this guy finally looks over there and I go up and he turns back like they tend to do. So I have to do this battle before we're able to get our encounter. But 
per usual, even with a paralysis going on, I am able to quickly take out Murkrow. Then he brings out Pupitar, which I go ahead and I switch off of into Emperor, because Emperor can use Surf. I accidentally use Whirlpool, but it still one-shots it somehow. Then he goes into Skarmory, which I, I intentionally actually hit Surf on. So now we can go up and get our encounter. I switch to having Victory Bell first in the party. And we run up to the grass, and we prepare. And what do you think we get? We are blessed with a Cascoon, which is absolutely atrocious and nothing we really want. So just like the Quillfish before it, I jump into the bag, throw a Quick Ball, and I say, hey, if we catch it, we catch it. If we don't, I'll kill it. But we catch it because all of the weak Pokemon love joining us. And I go ahead and I give it a name. I fumble around with some jokes, and I land on naming it Cast... Cast, 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 cat, a, uh, strof. So I was going for catastrophe because I was just like, this is a catastrophe of a Pokemon to get. But like all the other fun names I come up with, they are too long for the character limit in Heart, Gold, Soul, Silver. So we now have uh, Cascoon the Catastroph. And that's where I am going to end this episode. Next time we will have episode 14, I will be heading to the Pokemon League. And it may be a little long of an episode because we will be facing the entire Pokemon League. But thank you for watching. I will talk to you all next time. Um, and I will be back to live recording the next episode.